Okay, let's start again. Uh, last time I did not finish my last example for example three in uh, in that 17, uh, 14.7, right? So let me finish it up. It's just a little bit more, but at the same time, I want to show you how uh, complicated it can be. Give me a second, give me a second. Yeah, last time we did part of example three. Now the thing is like, uh, why I want to do this problem? I want you to realize that the the topics that we have in this 14.7 and 14.8 later on will be quite complicated. Okay, it, it is uh, divided into two parts. The first step, we do the critical points in the boundaries. And then the second part is we do the critical points. Uh, I'm sorry, the per first one, critical points in the interior of the domain D, the set D, region D. And the second part, we do the critical points and endpoints on the boundary of that region D. Now, the thing is, if the boundaries happen to be a segment like this, then we have no choice but to parameterize that using four different paths. Okay. Now, uh, what we did last time, I did up to, uh, I did fully uh, gamma one. But then when I work on gamma two, I believe I ended at uh, like trying to find out the value at F13, F negative one three, uh, and then F two three, and F negative two three. Now, we are supposed to plug those coordinates into this original function here, right? Supposed to be to put it in here. However, we happen to already have the function when y equals to 3. So we can actually use this one. We can actually use this one. Okay, because the y already 3. Does it make sense? Okay, that act makes our computation a lot faster. So f13 will be when, when this x equals to 1, that will be uh, 1 minus 3 plus 9, that is what, 7? And then f negative 1, that will be negative 1 plus 3 plus 9, that's 11. f2, 3 will be 8 minus 6 plus 9, that's 11. And then negative 2, comma 3, that will be uh, 7 again. Oh. Okay, so using this, 1, 3, negative 1, 3, 1, 3, negative 1, 3, this is, I'm sorry, uh, 1, 3 is 11, 1, 3 is 11, this is 7, and then 2, 3 is 11, negative 2, 3, 7, so this is also 7 here, okay. Now then, uh, gamma 3. So you see how painful it will be, right? I, of course, if you ask me, will I ask this kind of question in your test? Uh, not with four paths, but I think three paths will be reasonable. The one you saw in example one in the previous lecture, okay? In 14.7b, example one, the one that has a triangle, Okay, I think that one is reasonable, especially because uh, uh, two of them on the axis, like this is on x axis, so the y is zero. This guy is on the y axis, that's why, uh, and the, the x is zero. The computation suddenly becomes a lot easier. Okay, simpler. Now, but the one here, uh, none of the segments turns out to be on a nice number, right? Gamma three, we have x equals to negative two. So x equals to negative 2 and the y is from negative, th what? I'm sorry, I need to go back here. Negative 2 up to 3. Negative 2 up to 3. Okay, so uh, what is the function again? I'm sorry, I need to keep on scrolling up and down. Let me copy that. Uh, x cubed minus 3x minus y cubed plus 2y. So fxy equals 2x cubed 
minus 3x uh, minus y cubed plus 12y. Am I copying it right? Okay. So when x equals to negative 2, then this function, supposed to be multivariable function of x and y, now becomes a function of y only because we set the x to be negative 2. That is negative y cubed plus 12y minus 8 plus 6, that's minus 2. So the derivative of that function respect to y, notice that because this function is now a single variable function, then I can use uh, df dy. Okay, that will give me negative 3y squared plus 12. When I set it equals to 0, uh, then I get y squared equals to 4 and y equals to plus minus 2. In other words, the critical points will be when x equals to negative 2, the y is 2 or negative 2. Now, of course, we need to be aware the endpoints are, if we go back to this picture here, you know what, let me copy that picture. Uh, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, let me screenshot that. And then put it here so that I don't need to keep on scrolling up and down. So now we have the critical. The endpoints are negative 2, comma, negative 2. The other endpoints is negative 2, comma, 3, right? And I think we already compute negative 2, comma, 3, right? F negative 2 comma 3 is equal to we have that here equals to 7 okay f negative 2 comma 2 let's see that will be negative of 2 q plus 12 times 2 minus 2 negative 8 plus 24 that's 16 minus 2 that's 14 and f negative 2 comma negative 2 that will be negative of negative 2 cubed plus 12 times negative 2 minus 2 that's positive 8 minus 24 minus 2 that's negative 16 negative 18 okay so here that's negative 18 at negative 2 3 that's 7 negative 2 2 that's 14 so here that's 14 do i miss anything i think that's all huh? okay so that negative 2 negative 2 happens to be critical points and also endpoints okay now finally along lambda 4 or the fourth path notice that it is from negative 2 comma negative 2 to 2 comma 2 right i can parameterize that using uh, r t uh, the t comma t uh, for t between negative 2 to 2 okay but basically x and y are equal right so f t comma t now f t comma t now i basically replace the uh, x and y by t that will be t cubed minus 3 t minus t cubed plus 12 t Okay, and then from there I go on, simplify, compute, uh, this is equal to 90, oh, that's easy, uh, this is increasing, right, this is an increasing function, 
therefore no critical numbers except at the endpoints right uh, in other words if i do d f t comma t respect to t that will be a constant nine right which is an increasing function okay so we don't have no critical points uh, but the endpoints are uh, negative 2 comma negative 2 uh, 2 comma 2 which we already computed the value okay we already compute the value now let's come back here and we see what is the maximum we have the maximum here and here and the minimum here you see that okay so we have a lot of critical points and endpoints right uh, but doing that kind of comparison we see oh uh, so the function is maximum the function is uh, the fun function has maximum value 18 has absolute max value 18 at uh, negative one comma two and two comma two negative one comma two and two comma two and absolute minimum negative eighteen at negative two comma negative two now I understand I may have made some miscomputation somewhere okay because i need to scroll up and down right okay but the technique is basically like this and i think this what i did here is very helpful okay instead of writing the coordinates uh, one by one all right this provide us the visual right away uh, which points we already deal with and what's the value okay so at this coordinate is 14 18 14 18 Okay, negative 18, negative 11, and so on and so forth. Okay. <clears throat> now that's for this section here. Uh, let me give you the suggested homework. Oops. Let me give you the suggested homework. Uh, suggested homework from this 14.7b continue to C are number 29 to 35 and then 39 to 53 okay now if I summarize this section first part it's it's about finding maximum minimum value and where right finding local max minimum and absolute max mean now case number one case one is when uh, no restriction no restriction or uh, no constraint now usually the questions will be uh, the questions will be fine critical points and then from that critical points you categorize or find out if it is a local max, local mean, or settle. Okay, now usually the, this, when we have this type of question, uh, we don't have uh, the D, no, they don't tell us, uh, find the maximum, absolute maximum, absolute minimum in the certain region. Okay, so you will see the second 
uh, step here, basically, we do a second derivative test. Okay, case two, that's when we have with restriction or with constraint. Uh, that's what we have in 14.7b. This is 14.7a. With constraint, then, what we do is find uh, first critical point in the interior of in the interior of region D. Now, second, we find the critical points on the boundary of D. And don't forget also the endpoints on the boundary, if any. Okay. Uh, you will see that in our next section, in our next section, we have uh, another method to find um, to find absolute maximum, absolute minimum, or local maximum, local minimum, uh, with constraint. Okay, with constraint. Uh, in other words, in other words, the question we have in fourteen point seven b to maximize or minimize a function given a constraint may also be doable using method we will learn very soon okay and that method is lagrange multiplier method so section 14.8 lagrange multiplier multipliers method now you will see this method is being used maybe not always not always use to find max or mean values of a function f subject to subject to a constraint or more than one constraint okay i think that's the key that's the key in case you you kind of like confused well when can i do this when you can i do that uh we use lagrange multiplier method if we have constraint Okay, now uh, the method that we learn in 14.7 can be used in general. Okay, with constraint or without constraint. Okay, uh, if without constraint, then usually the question is uh, local max, local mean, is it set point? That's where we do secondary derivative tests. Okay, but if it is with constraint, notice that in this 14.7b, the one with constraint, we don't need to find uh the we don't need to do secondary derivative test we basically find all the critical points and endpoints and compute the values for each of them and then do the comparison okay uh in other words uh 18 is the absolute maximum in this d here in this d here 18 is the absolute maximum in this d okay but if we don't restrict the domain into this trapezoid side if we don't restrict the region into this trapezoid side uh, size then uh, we may not have absolute maximum we may not have absolute minimum at that time we will be interested in local maximum local minimum or the saddle case okay now Let's go back to that 14.8. Let's see what this method talks about first. Okay. To find the maximum minimum values of a function subject to a constraint G equals to constant, assuming that these extreme values exist and the gradient of G is not equal to zero, is not equal to factor zero. Oh, that's important. The gradient of G is not 
uh, 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 factor zero on the surface of that constraint. Then what we will do? We will first find all the values and the lambda. They use this lambda here to bear the first initial of that Lagrange. Okay, so basically what we need to do is we find, we set the equation, the gradient of F equals to lambda multiple, lambda is a scalar, lambda multiple of the gradient of G. And uh, uh, the coordinates we have needs to satisfy the constraint. Okay, now once you get those coordinates, then we go to step B, we evaluate the value of the function at those coordinates. Okay, now, uh, what, I am ex what I explained just now uh, seems to be like, oh, that's the method, but why that method works? Why that method works? Uh, because of the following, Lagrange happens to identify some uh, some phenomena, uh, which in my opinion is quite quite smart. Suppose, suppose, just from two dimension point of view, in two dimension. Suppose I have a, suppose I have a coordinate system, right? And then I have a line. Let's say that line is something like this. Okay. Let's say that's the line. Now suppose I want to find out the question is. So let's say this is line L here. Find the largest circle. This is just to illustrate. So I don't use numbers yet. I just give you the idea. Find the largest circle centered at origin. Find the largest circle centered origin uh, actually I should say the smallest circle huh the smallest circle centered at origin send smallest circle centered or at origin uh, intersecting L. Now notice that if I use this circle for example, oh, this circle is too small because it doesn't intersect L, right? So we can enlarge this circle, still not intersecting, enlarge this circle, this start to intersect, right? Now we can enlarge that again, okay, this is still intersect, right? But this circle is intersecting uh, uh this we can find this circle here which, which already intersect the line l but smaller than the last circle we have this circle here is the smallest circle intersecting line l centered at origin okay of course we can find a lot other circles intersecting l but those circles must be larger than this circle okay now what lagrange observe this is this is not the example lagrange c by the way this is my example okay this is my example now what lagrange observe is the following lagrange notice that when that happened when that happened when this circle reached the smallest when that happened, the gradient of the function, the circle function, that's the gradient, the gradient of F, okay, happens to be parallel to the gradient of the constraint L. Happens to be parallel. That is not the case with when it is larger, right? You see, when it is larger, this is the gradient of line L. This is the gradient of G, right? Gradient of the constraint. But 
at that point, the gradient of the function is like this. Okay. In other words, uh, when it is the largest or the smallest, you will see the maximum or the minimum. When that happens, the gradient of the functions that we try to maximize or minimize must be parallel to the gradient of the constraint. Okay, maybe I'll write it down. When the circle... is smallest and intersect intersecting L the gradient of F and the gradient of G are parallel at that point at the intersecting point okay now in other words in other words a uh, gradient of f at that coordinate let's call that coordinate ab is e uh, is parallel to the gradient of g at that coordinate AB or in other words the gradient of F at coordinate AB is equal to some scalar multiple of gradient of the constraint at coordinate AB okay now that's where Lagrange insists you should not use K you should use lambda so that you remember my name Okay, that's the idea. That's the idea. And you can you can uh, observe uh, actually a lot of things from there. Okay, that uh, this is uh, almost always true, except when except when uh, the gradient is happens to be zero, right? If the gradient is zero uh, on that constraint, or if something else happened in which like the uh, Basically, the derivative is not continuous. Okay. Now, let's see. How do we apply this? Uh, my suggestion for you is please read. Please read examples 1 to 4. Uh, in this section 14.8. Okay, of course, I can just go over those examples, but since you can read yourself, I rather just let you read yourself and I do another problem. Okay, I will do another problem. So what I'm doing, going to do here is number eight. Uh, number eight is we want to find the maximum value, find max or mean. Okay, and this is the constraint. Okay, well, I think it's too small, huh? Let me make it a bit larger. Okay. Okay, so let's define let G X Y C equals to X plus Y plus C equals to 12. So if you think about this, this is basically augmentation. It's supposed to be a function, an equation with three variables. Now we make it a function with three variables, but we set it into a constant. Okay, now then find the gradient of f, the gradient of f. Remember the gradient of f from, from, 
from I think 14.6 uh, we learned that gradient of F is normal to the surface okay basically what I said in this picture here okay or the level curve surface curve now the gradient of F is equal to 2x to y to z and gradient of g is 1 comma 1 comma 1 okay give me a second okay uh so am i might continue the... yeah mm -hmm. so uh so that those are the gradients so what do we need to solve what we need to solve are we need to solve for all the coordinates x, y, z that satisfy this. And the constraint. That's what we need to solve. Okay, that's what we need to solve. Okay, so uh, if I really line them up, you will notice that the x component of uh, the gradients will be uh, 2x for gradient of f equals to lambda times 1 for the gradient of uh, lambda uh, gradient of g. 2y equals to lambda times 1, which is lambda. 2z equals to lambda times 1 which is lambda and it has to satisfy x plus y plus z equals to 12 okay we need to find all the solutions that satisfy these four equations here okay now notice that we need to solve four things okay not only three equation that comes from the the gradients but also needs to satisfy the constraint okay you will see that uh, we basically have uh, four variables because we introduce a new variable in the three equations. You have x and y and c, that's the uh, three variables, but then we have lambda. Now we have four variables, right? So to solve four variables, uh, a system of equations with four variables, you need uh, four equations. Okay? Now, then, how do we solve this thing? Mm. Uh, I think one way I can do is uh, to substitute the x, y, and z into lambda. Right? That's one way to do it. So this is lambda over 2. Eh? I'm sorry. This is lambda over 2 plus lambda over 2 plus lambda over 2 equals to 12. Right? Okay. So from here we get x equals to lambda over 2, y equals to lambda over 2, z equals to lambda over 2. And then when I substitute them in, I get 3 lambda over 2 equals to 12. So lambda equals to 24 divided by 3 is 8. Okay, now once lambda equals to 8, when I substitute that into x, y, z, I get x equals to 4 y equals to 4, z equals to 4. Is it okay so far? Now then, uh, from there, we see that... Okay, so we are done uh, with the, the critical points, quote-unquote. The critical points uh, is 4, 4, 4. Okay. Now, of course, we need to also consider uh, the. Is it? Do we need the maximum or do we need the minimum? I forgot. Let me see the question again. Oh, you know what? I can worry about that later on. Uh, so, uh, what is the value at four four four? Value at four 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 will be four squared plus four squared plus four squared. That's sixteen times three. That's 48. Now the question is, is this, is this a 
maximum or minimum? So we get the critical points, but we don't know if that critical points is the will give us the maximum, the minimum, or maybe the sidewall case. Okay. Now, uh, the thing is, there are other coordinates. There are other coordinates in this constraint that we can use to find the value uh, of the function, right? Okay. Let's pick a number. Let's pick a number. For example, 1200. Notice that 1200 is in the constraint, right? Satisfy the constraint. But if I use 1200 into that function, do I get a value greater than or less than or 48? Okay, so basically I'm doing this. I'm doing this. Okay. So, so F twelve zero zero give us twelve squared plus zero plus zero, which is one hundred forty four. From here, then we see then F four 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 is minimum. Okay, and the minimum value is 48. Now, let's try to visualize this situation. Let's try to visualize this situation here with uh, our picture. Hmm, hold on. Where did I put that software earlier? I'm sorry. Give me a second. I buy, I end up buying the software. Uh, let me share with you this one here. Okay, so we have uh, x plus y plus z equals to 12. And then uh, another one is um, what is that? Mm. No, I don't think I can graph this, huh? Oh, yeah. Uh, X squared plus Y squared plus C squared equals to 48. Uh, what happened? Holland, 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 Holland. Oh, I have this issue here. Parameter. Sorry. Show keypad. Uh, what else I need to show? Maybe zoom out. How do I zoom out? Uh, Ah, now it's better. So I basically want to show this. Okay, so do you see the plane? That's the plane. Okay, and this circle, uh, this uh, x squared plus y squared plus c squared here will first time touch, I'm sorry, I, this kind of like ugly, uh, will touch that surface first time when the radius of that sphere is square root of 48. Uh, how do you know, Thomas? Let's in increase this a little bit, 0.1 maybe. Do you see that red color? Maybe I make it this one. Do you see that now? Okay, or maybe 0 0.01, uh, too small, 0 0.03. Now you see that dot, right? Okay, you see that dot? Uh, but if I make it exactly 14, uh, 48 as my R squared, it's barely touching it. Okay, now on the other hand, if I make it larger, let's say 
50, uh, then uh, it will intersect at more points. In fact, it will intersect at a circle. You see? I hope you can see my screen. Right? Okay? You know. So, uh, then you will see that x squared plus y squared plus c squared will have the minimum value at 48. Okay, that's basically the first time it touched. First time it touched the, the. First time it touched the the plane. Okay. But once the r squared, the rho squared is greater than square root of uh, rho squared is greater than forty eight, then the sphere will in, will intersect the plane. At larger place okay not just at one point but at a circle on the other hand if it is less than 48 let's say 47.9 it will not touch we have to see underneath though to see that better right yeah, but it will not touch okay very very close but not touching okay now that's what happened mm. <clears throat> So for this question here, uh, we you see that I solve that system of equation. Three variables uh, have something to do with the gradients with lambda, and then the fourth, we need a fourth equation. The fourth equation coming from the constraint. Okay. Next, uh, I have this more this question here, number eleven and number twelve, and I will do both of these questions because they are very similar let's do number 11 first let's do number 11 first for that number 11 give me a second we have the function that we need to maximize or minimize is x squared plus y squared plus c squared remember that's the function of a sphere a sphere function right so this function actually represent the square of the radius of that sphere now the constraint is x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus c to the fourth equals to one okay that's the constraint Okay, now uh, suppose this gives us a frame. Let's uh, later on you will see it looks like a dice, a die, like the per, the the singular of dice, the one you play. Uh, if you go to casino, people will use that die to play craps, right? Okay, it looks similar to that, not exactly. Okay, now so the question will be when, at what value? and at what coordinate at what coordinates will the sphere first touch the die and at what coordinate you see the the sphere get larger and larger right so the spheres originally small it does it's inside this inside this cube here Right? It doesn't touch the cube. When you enlarge that at one point, it will touch the die, the cube. Okay? And uh, it will touch, touch, touch. And at one point, when it is too big, uh, it will not touch anymore because the whole, uh, the whole cube are fully contained in the sphere. So, so originally, the sphere is inside the, the cube. Okay, but when you enlarge, 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 enlarge the sphere, at one point, the sphere will be larger than the cube, right? Now, the question is when and where it will first touch it, and when and where it will last touch it, okay? Now, this question you will see is very complicated, though. Uh, so, one thing I need to warn you ahead, ahead of time is keep track of your work 
write the notation properly and explain it to yourself so that you don't lose track. Okay. Yeah. I can say this because uh, I remember I did this problem before and uh, I myself at first a bit confused about like, uh, what did I do? What I, what I have done, what I have not done. Okay. Now, so the first step, is I define the constraint function and then do the uh, gradient that will be the regular 2x 2y 2z for the gradient of f the gradient of g will be 4x cubed 4y cubed 4c cubed okay Okay, it has to satisfy, it has to satisfy the gradient of f equals to lambda times gradient of g and g x y z has to be equals to 1. Okay. In other words, if I break it into components by components, then I will have 2x equals to 4 lambda x cubed, 2y equals to 4 lambda y cubed, 2z equals to 4 lambda z cubed, and x to the 4th plus y to the 4th plus c to the 4th equals to 1. Now we get into some situation. How do we solve this? Right? How do we solve this? Hmm. Honestly, I don't really know though. <laughs> Honestly, I don't really know. But uh, let's see. So from the first equation, we see that uh, 2x plus 4 lambda x cubed uh, if I set that equals to 0, 4 lambda x cubed minus 2x, if I factor the 2x, I will get 2 lambda x squared minus 1, right? So either x equals to 0 or x squared equals to 1 over 2 lambda. Okay, in fact, from equation number 2, we will get the same situation either y equals to 0 or y squared equals to 1 over 2 lambda. For equation 3, we get z equals to 0 or c, Q, uh, c squared equals to 1 over 2 lambda. Okay, now notice that we only work with three equations right now, but we still have to satisfy the fourth equation. Okay, so we need to think of all possible outcomes from this situation here okay now one of them is when x and y and z equals to zero now the thing is x uh, zero squared plus into equation four Right. If I put it in equation 4, 0 squared plus 0 squared plus 0 squared, that is not equals to 1. So the first possibility 0, 0, 0 is not, is not a critical number. Okay. Now, what happens if x equals to y equals to 0, but then the c squared equals to 1 over 2 lambda? Then we will have in equation 4, that will be 0 squared plus 0 squared plus 1 over 4 lambda squared, c to the fourth, right? That's equals to 1. Therefore, 4 lambda squared equals to 1 lambda squared equals to 1 fourth lambda equals to plus minus 1 half. Which implies... Uh, actually, I don't need to, huh? I basically get, uh, yeah, uh, so 2 lambda equals to plus minus 1, which is our z, right? z squared 
equals to c squared 1 over 2 lambda but because it's c squared then it has to be only 1 huh not the minus right not the minus Okay, so c squared must be equals to 1, which implies c is plus minus 1. So, one of the critical numbers are 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Okay, with the same logic, when x equals to c equals to 0, but the y squared equals to 1 over 2 lambda, uh, we will have the same situation will get 0, 1, 0, 0, negative 1, 0. For the third case, when yz equals to 0, but the x squared equals to 1 over 2 lambda. We will get the critical points 1, 0, 0. One, negative one zero zero okay so uh, going back to this this you need to find all possible combination that makes this true okay if all of them zero if two of them zeros we already dealt with that right if all of them zeros if two of them equals to zero there are three ways what if only one of them zero? If one of uh, if only x equals to zero, then the y squared is equals to c squared equals to one over two lambda, right? If I plug that into equation four, I will get zero squared plus one over four lambda squared plus one over four lambda squared equals to one. That's 2 over 4 lambda squared equals to 1. So 2 lambda squared equals to 1. Right? Is it 2 lambda squared? I think I, I may have computed incorrectly. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So lambda squared equals to 1 half. Okay. or lambda equals to plus minus 1 over square root of 2 but y squared equals to c squared uh, must be greater equals to 0 right it implies the lambda has to be only positive 1 over square root of 2 okay so y squared equals to c squared equals to 1 over 2 times 1 over square root of 2. Huh. Do you see that? I basically plug in my lambda. Okay. Which means this is equal to 1 over square root of 2. Okay. So y uh, is equal to plus minus the square root of that the square root of this right let me just write it as plus minus uh, 2 to the power of 1 negative 1 fourth okay or the fourth root right 1 over fourth root uh, maybe I write it that way plus minus 1 over the fourth root of 2 the C as well So, from there, we get how many critical points? Uh, x is 0. The y is 1 over 4th root of 2. The z is 4th root of 1 over 4th root of 2. Or, 
the Y is the positive branch, yet the C is the negative branch. Or the Y is negative branch, the C is the positive branch. Or the X is zero, but the X, the Y and C are both the negative branch. Okay, now the thing is, we still have two other cases where one of them zero. When we plug that in, consequently, we get these critical points. 1 over 4th root of 2, comma, 0, comma, 1 over 4th root of 2. 1 over 4th root of 2, comma, 0, comma, negative 1 over 4th root of 2. The positive branch. Uh, negative branch, positive branch, and negative branch, negative branch. Okay. And last one. Oh, no, this is not really last one. Second from the last case. So when C equals to zero, but the other two, x squared and y squared, are 1 over 2 lambda. I hope at this point you already see how important it is to keep track of your work. Because, yes, it seems like we have only, oh, yeah, the, uh, then we need to solve this, right? These are the possible solutions. You know, that's, those are the solutions for, solutions for only three equations, equation 1, 2, 3. You are not dealing with equation 4 yet. Okay, those are the possibilities. But when you think about the possibilities, it is possible that all three zeros or two of them zeros means uh, one of them's not, or one of them zero but two of them not, right? Okay, or the last case you will see later on what happens if none of them zero. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, let me continue from here. Uh, in this case, the z equals to zero. So it's one over a fourth root of two, one over fourth root of two comma zero. One over fourth root of two comma negative one over fourth root of two comma zero. Negative one over fourth root of two comma positive 1 over 4 root of 2 comma 0 and the last one is both negative branches okay we have four critical points here another four and another four 12 so far plus 6 18 right <laughs> but we are not done yet we have one more Actually, we have six more. What happened if all of them not zero? If I plug that into equation four, then I get x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus c to the fourth equals to one. That is three over four lambda squared equals to one. So three fourth equals to lambda squared. Lambda is plus minus radical three over two. Okay. Now, however, because x squared equals to y squared equals to c squared equals to 1 over uh, 2 lambda uh, that has to be at least 0 right consequently we can only use lambda the positive branch however when i do the square root let's let's uh when i do the square root of these uh hold on hmm. so let's put it in first so x squared equals to 1 over 2 times square root of 3 over 2, right? 
it gets x squared equals to y squared equals to c squared which is 1 over square root of 3 so our x uh, y c will be equals to plus minus the square root of square root that's the fourth root of 3 okay the fourth root of 3 Actually, there are eight possible points here. Is it right? Okay. So the coordinates are 1 over square root of uh, fourth root of 3, 1 over fourth root of 3, 1 over fourth root of 3, uh, and then all the possible combination. Let me just, just plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. So there are eight coordinates there. Okay. So the first one is... Uh, the first one is we have one or negative one. The rest are zero, right? There are six of them. And then the second type, we have one zero, but the other two are one over fourth root of two with plus minus. And the third type is uh, plus minus of one over fourth root of three for each of them. Okay, now let's compute the value. The value of x, y, c equals to x squared plus y squared plus c squared. Okay. f of plus minus 1, 0, 0. That's the same to the value at 0 plus minus 1, 0 because of the symmetry, right? f, 0, 0 plus minus 1. That will be just 1 for uh, plus minus 1 over 4th root of 2, 1 over 4th root of 2 comma 0 equals to f plus minus 1 over 4th root of 2 comma 0 comma plus minus 1 over 4th root of 2. I'm tired. But I need to cover all of them. That's the thing. Right? The nice thing is we have that symmetry. Whatever happened to x also happened to y's, also happened to z's. In most cases, right? It's the fourth root of two. Uh, that's equals to. Uh, if I square it, that will be one over square root of two plus one over square root of two. That's two over square root of two. That's square root of two, which is greater than one. Okay. But what happens if we have plus minus 1 over 4th root of 3, comma, plus minus 1 over 4th root of 3, comma, 1 plus minus 1 over 4th root of 3. Then that will be 1 over square root of 3, plus 1 over square root of 3, plus 1 over square root of 3, equals to 3 over square root of 3, which is square root of 3. That's the largest, huh? Right? Okay, so the minimum value, minimum, okay, which one do we make a, uh, hold on, I kind of look struck. Which one do we need to optimize? Yeah, to the power of 4. Oh, this is this is the one we optimize. Okay, good, good. Okay, so it has to be on the cube, uh, but what is the radius of the circle? Okay, the radius square of the circle. Okay, the minimum value of f, minimum value of f is one at plus minus one zero 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 plus minus one zero 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 plus minus one the maximum value of f is square root of three at plus minus 1 over 4th root of 3 
plus minus 1 over 4th root of 3 plus minus 1 over 4th root of 3. Whew. A long work, huh? Okay. Let's try to see the what the graph look like. Okay. So I start with I start with x to the fourth plus y to the fourth plus c to the fourth set it equals to one. Okay, and then x squared plus y squared plus c squared also equals to 1. So this is when the sphere first time touch the cube. So I hope you can see the, 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 the graph here, right? The purple one is the, the one that looks like a dice. Okay, the sphere is fully inside of that. Now, if I want to show that it's fully inside of that and where they actually intersect, okay, where they actually intersect, let's increase this by a very little bit. Do we see that yet? Mm, hold on. I think it has something to do with... Now we can see that, yeah. Uh -huh. It's too big earlier. How do I zoom that in? The... I don't want to over zoom that. I want this this way. I over zoom this. Uh, yeah. So maybe a bit smaller. Change the color. Make it bright. Now you can see, right? Do you see the yellow? Okay. That's the first time. So what happened is I purposely make the sphere up, uh, inside the purple cube a bit larger so that you can see the intersection. Okay, it intersect at, let's see, maybe I screenshot this position. Okay. Make this lighter and make it darker. Okay, so and then I screenshot this and put it back in our nodes. Okay, so it hits the maximum, uh, the minimum value here, one zero zero, zero one zero, zero zero one, and of course the back also. Okay, that's the first time as the sphere grow inside this cube, like here, the sphere, uh, the 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 dice that look like a cube, as the sphere grow larger and larger, the first time it touch the cube is uh, at those coordinates okay now what happened if i increase the value of f to square root of three so let's change this to square root of three Seems like the sphere is too big, huh? Let me in make the size of the cube slightly larger. I hope you can see better. Now, do you see that now? Like, uh, basically the corner, basically the corner of the cube, too fast. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, want, I want to spin it this way then. Yeah, basically the corner of the cubes, actually uh, touch the sphere right okay yeah the corner of the the cube touch it hmm. but i try to find a best position to do the screenshot <laughs> so we may have a nice view 
like I mean a nice panorama right but we still have hard time to take the best the best point of view yeah this this I think this is better huh this is better ah ah I think this is a nice one rotate that a little bit I think I want to leave it like this. Okay, do the screenshot here. Okay, and bring it back to our uh, notes. Are we back at our notes? Yeah, okay. So this is when uh, minimum, right? Uh, minimum. That's the the first time the sphere actually touched the cube from inside, right? And then this is the last time. The last time the the sphere touched the cube from outside. Okay. Now the question is: So what is the significance of this radical two times? Let's take a look. What what does it mean? Okay, what we know is when it were radical 2 means the gradient are equal, right? The gradients are parallel. The gradients uh, of the sphere and the gradient of the cube are parallel. Let me enlarge it a little bit. Yeah, so what happened is this is way too big. Oh. I try to zoom out. It's too small. Zoom in. Zoom out. Yeah, so let me screenshot this then. This is when this is when f x y z equals to square root of two. Okay, the coordinates are here. These are the coordinates. So at those points, the the gradients of f, the gradient of g are parallel. Okay. But that's not the maximum, that's not the minimum. Okay, that's not the maximum, that's not the minimum. The maximum minimum cases we have saw above here. Okay? Now, if I look back to this question, see, uh, this question is long one, huh? Okay, welcome to Calculus 3, though. <laughs> that's the best I can say. Now, uh, what happened with number 12? Number 12 is very similar case, but the one that is moving is this guy. So the the sphere the sphere is fixed, right? Now the cube is the one that we grow. So the first time it will touch, it will start touch here, right? That's the first time it touch. Okay. The last time it touch is when the 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 cube is outside the sphere. Okay, that's uh, the case. Now, we actually have a lot of inter uh, interesting question uh, using this method, though. Uh, for example, for example, I can shorten the work here by playing with the symmetry. So, uh, in other words, in other words, if you look back to how I did this one here, I did one case uh, where we have two zeros, right? Okay. But once I get the case, the result, I replicate that for the two other cases, x y, x z, and y z, because what? Because if you look back to the function, x, y, z are symmetric. What do you mean by saying that these are symmetric, Thomas? It means uh, that we have symmetric means uh, they follow some uh, like 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 the like this one here. Like uh, this is symmetric with respect to the y-axis, right? A parabola and a circle is symmetric with respect to x and y-axis. 
Okay. Now, what happened in, in that case? Be, uh, how do we check that symmetric? How do we check that symmetric? You replace, you swap x and y. Do you get the same equation, the same function? You swap x and z. Do you have the same functions? You swap y and z. Do you have the same functions? Like that. Okay. If if it satisfies only these two, for example, but then we know at least the way x and y behave must be the same. Right? Okay, the way they behave must be the same. Okay, if x and y uh, are swappable without changing the function, x and z also swappable without changing the function, then we have that uh, you the value of x and y and z should be the same which is basically what we saw basically what we saw in the last case here right all three of them the same value with plus minus of course right with plus minus but uh, notice that i cut my work a lot shorter still long still long but a lot shorter by identifying that oh if i have all of them zero, it doesn't satisfy. If only two of them zeros, then I get these solutions, but I can replicate the work. Uh, if one of them zero, then this is the solution, and then I replicate the work. If all of them not zeros, what happened? I get these solutions, and then I observe the value for each of them. Okay? A long question, huh? Just, just want to, I think this is the second question I do. Yeah, this is the second question I do, but this question is super long, okay? This question is super long. Let's do something a bit more interesting. Uh, let's say I pick question from uh, the one I did before, before I give you a break, before I give you a break. Let me do a problem that I did before from 14.7, okay? Instead of doing examples in the book, okay? I do problems from uh, from 14.7 from 14.7 example to uh, the question was find the maximum and minimum values of f x y equals to x squared plus 2 y squared minus x on d which is defined to be all the coordinates where x squared plus y squared less than equals to 4. Now I try to show you how we do this problem okay uh, notice that notice that 14.4 here actually deal with the boundaries only you see the constraint is a boundary the constraint here is the boundary it's equals to constant right the constraint is a constant okay while the problems we do in 14.7b uh, it is on the region so the way we deal with this is first we will deal with the interior of d and then after that we deal with the boundary of d okay now when we deal with the interior of d we basically do for interior of d we basically do the first derivative right the partial derivative with respect to x respect to y's and then set them equals to zero okay basically the gradient of f that's 2x minus 1 comma 4y we set that equals to factor 0 from there we get x equals to 1 half and y equals to 0 okay so the value at 1 half comma 0 equals to 1 fourth plus 0 minus 1 half that's negative 1 fourth Okay, now how about at the boundary? On the boundary, uh, 
we actually in the past we parameterized that right okay right now we don't right now we don't on the boundary we actually deal with x squared plus y squared equals to 4 call that our constraint let gxy equals to x squared plus y squared equals to 4 so the gradient of g therefore equals to 2x 2y okay now so what we need to solve now is the gradient of f equals to lambda gradient of g which means and and of course the g uh, x y equals to 4 right it basically means i need to solve the following 2x minus 1 equals to 2 lambda x for the x component for the y component 4y equals to 2 lambda y and then uh, finally x squared plus y squared equals to 4 how do we solve this <clears throat> <clears throat> So first one here, okay, let's use equation number two. So 4y equals to 2 lambda y. Do not divide by y both sides. No, because y may be zero. In fact, that's one of the answer. 2 lambda y minus 4y equals to zero. So if I factor the 2y out, I get lambda minus 2. So either y equals to zero or lambda equals to 2. You see that okay likewise in equation one okay two lambda x minus two x plus one equals to zero uh, it's kind of hard to work in to work it out okay now suppose so i start with when y equals to zero <clears throat> so when y equals to zero then what will my x be well, then i plug that into equation number three right x squared plus zero squared equals to four so x equals to plus minus two so the coordinates are uh, plus minus two comma zero okay now what is the value of at two comma zero the value at two comma zero will be what's the function again x squared plus 2y squared minus x so x squared plus 2y squared minus x that's 2 okay. at negative 2 comma 0 that's negative 2 squared plus 2 times 0 squared minus negative 2 that's 4 plus 2 that's 6 that's when y equals to 0 how about when lambda equals to 2? When lambda equals to 2, when lambda equals to 2, then we go to equation 1 first. Right? <clears throat> when lambda equals to 2, uh, then in equation 1, we get 4x minus 2x plus 1 equals to 0. So 2x equals negative 1. Uh, negative one. So x equals negative one half. How about the y? Okay. And the y will be, I plug that into equation three, uh, x squared. Plus y squared equals to four. Is it right? Yeah, uh -huh. right. So y squared equals to four minus one fourth. 16 minus 1 that's 15 over 4 so y equals to plus minus square root of 15 over 2 in other words the coordinates will be negative 1 half plus minus square root of 15 over 2 let's see if that's the answer we have at that time Let's see if that's the answer we have at that time. According to my notes, right? We see, at least we know that's one of the critical numbers, right? 
as one of the critical numbers. You see that? Okay, now let's go back. <clears throat> hmm. So how about the function at negative one half uh, plus minus square root of 15 over two. As I remember that's x squared plus two y squared minus x, right? So that's one fourth plus two times 15 over four plus one half. That's one fourth plus 15 over two plus one half. That's 8.25. Okay, so minimum value is negative 0 0.25 at negative 1 half comma 0. Right, let's look back, let's look back. We have that, oops, we have that here. Okay. 1 half, comma, uh, 1 half comma 0, not negative 1 half comma 0, what am I doing? Yeah, 1 half comma 0, not negative 1 half comma 0. <clears throat> the maximum is, maximum happens at two different coordinates, 8.25 at negative 1 half comma plus minus square root of 15 over 2. compared to what we have before. Do you see this? The right hand side here. Okay. <clears throat> now, the thing is, <clears throat> you have seen earlier, you have seen earlier in our previous examples that applying Lagrange multiplier may not be sure. Okay. In our example two that I gave here, it seems like Lagrange multiplier method is shorter. <clears throat> okay. What I'm saying is like, we never know. We never know when, when will that be easier to use Lagrange? When will that be easier uh, to use uh, the, 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 what's that? Uh, go along the boundary method thingy. No, we don't have any way. We don't have any way to, tell way uh, tell way in the fence okay now uh unfortunately i cannot do too much too many problems here because of the time restriction oh well, you know what i will do one more problem i will do one more problem uh i'm not rushing to the next section anyway but let's take a break first uh right now it's 602 we come back at 612. okay next let's do a problem from this 14.7 but instead of using the method we have in 14.7, we will use Lagrange multiplier method. Okay, so find the points on the cone that are closest to a point, another point. Uh, if we try to sketch the situation, the point we choose has to be on the cone. Call that X, Y, Z. Okay, now that XYZ must satisfy the constraint, right? So the constraint will be C squared equals to X squared plus Y squared. Now I need to call this a function, make this a function, okay, which is equal to constant. So one way to do it is to set one side equals to zero or basically set one side equals to constant. So let GX equals to x squared plus y squared minus z squared and then you set this equals to zero okay that's the constraint okay now what is the one we need to maximize or in this case the minimize we need to minimize the distance right minimize the distance of that xyz on the cone to the coordinate 4 to 0. 
okay in other words we need to minimize the distance d you can call that xyz as the square root of x minus 4 squared plus y minus 2 squared plus c squared uh, but to make to minimize this value uh, it's the same to minimize the the radicand in other words, instead of minimizing d function here, uh, function d here, I will minimize this function, which is the right, uh, the radicand. I will minimize x minus 4 squared plus y minus 2 squared plus c squared. Okay, that's what I will minimize. Okay, so let's start with solution. The gradient of f is... 2 times x minus 4, 2 times y minus 2 into z. The gradient of g, however, is 2x, 2y, negative 2z. Okay, and it has to satisfy these equations. Uh, 2 times x minus 4 equals to 2 lambda x. 2 times y minus 2 is equal to 2 lambda y. And 2z equals to negative 2 lambda z. Okay, hmm, how do we solve this? Oh, one more. Uh, it has to satisfy x squared plus y squared minus c squared equals to zero. Hmm, okay. So I think the easiest one I can play with is this one here, equation number three, where 2z plus 2 lambda c equals to 0. If I factor this 2z out, I get 1 plus lambda equals to 0. So either c equals to 0 or lambda equals to negative 1. Okay. Now, if I plug this into equation 4, 4 z equals to zero when i plug that into equation four notice i don't touch equation one and two yet okay i don't touch equation one and two yet uh, you will see that uh, when c equals to zero then in equation four i get x squared plus y squared equals to zero there's no way except that x and y equals to zero Right? There's no way. My x squared plus y squared equals to zero only when x equals to y equals to zero. In other words, the coordinates that we are talking about is zero, zero, zero. However, I don't think this satisfies the other two equations. Right? You see what I mean? Okay. So, uh, so in equation one, if I plug this into equation one, you will see that two times negative four equals to zero but that's not true right in other words c equals to zero results in x and y also equals to zero result in contradiction right in fact if i plug in into equation two uh, when the y is zero two times negative two uh, when the y is zero, we also have contradiction so c equals to zero result in zero 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 which does not satisfy all the equations okay now what happened if we deal with lambda equals to negative one when lambda equals to negative one then in equation one we get two times x minus four equals to negative two x okay so two x minus eight equals to negative two x so four x equals to eight x equals to two in equation 2, 2 times y minus 2 equals to negative 2y. In fact, I can divide by negative 2 here, actually. y minus 2 equals to... Divide by 2. 
So negative y, so I get 2y equals to 2, y equals to 1. Okay, and then using these, I will get the z, right? Okay, I get x equals to 2, y equals to 1, using equation, result from 1 and result from 2 together. Well, you know what, instead of writing it that way. So, so when x equals to 2 and y equals to 1, that gives me uh, 2 squared plus 1 squared minus c squared equals to 0, c squared equals to 5. So c equals to plus minus square root of 5. Okay, so now we have the coordinates 2, 1, plus minus square root of 5. Okay. These two coordinates, the coordinates, the coordinates, I think I should just say the R on the cone. And closest to. Four to zero. Okay. If you care to graph that, uh, so let's say we have a cone. The cone is actually that equation actually implies that's a double cone, the one on the top and also the one at the bottom. Right now, four comma two comma zero happens to be on x y plane. So let's say something here. Right, I hope that explains it. it it's closest to which coordinates? Something on the top, something on, sideways. If we see it sideways, okay, it's closest to one of the point here and one of the point there. Let's say this is four comma two comma zero. Okay, that's closest to uh, 2, 1, square root of 5, and 2, 1, negative square root of 5. Yeah. Okay, notice that the cone itself is symmetric with respect to uh, the xy plane, right? And 4, 2, 0 also on xy plane. Okay, I guess that's what I, uh, can I do one more problem, you know, because this, this section for me is quite interesting. I think I saw a good problem earlier. Do I really want to do that one? Uh, let me give me a second. Let me see that again. Because the following question is actually quite, yeah. this question here is actually quite a problem that we see a lot. Number 51 again from 14.7. A cardboard box without a lid is to have a volume of 32,000 centimeter cube. So in other words, uh, of course, we know what the volume of a box should be, right? The volume of a box, suppose I have that box with dimension x and y and z the volume of the box is defined to be x y z which is known to be 32,000 centimeter cube okay now this box is without a lid okay what is the surface area because they want to find out the dimensions that minimize the amount of cardboard use to have this uh, to have this uh, uh, cardboard box okay so basically the area as a function of x and y and c will be the base is x y no top right only the base plus 
the sideways will be two times yz and in front the back the front and the back is two times xz okay now this is the constraint and this is what we want to minimize okay so gradient of a is equal to x plus i'm sorry y plus 2z y plus 2z respect to y will be x plus 2z respect to z will be 2x plus 2y while the gradient of v will be yc xz xy Okay, so the system we need to solve will be y plus 2z equals to lambda yz x plus 2z equals to lambda xz okay 2x plus 2y equals to lambda xy hmm interesting huh how do we approach this kind of question? Oh, one more. Uh, I almost forget again. X, Y, Z equals to 32,000. How do we solve this? <clears throat> uh, you have to be quite creative, though. Okay, to, to solve this kind of questions, uh, solving system of equations where we don't have linear equations, right? We have a mixture of that. Mm, yes. So let me show you this way. Notice that this is missing X, this is missing Y, this is missing Z. Uh, but if we have X, Y, Z, we can replace that by 32,000, right? Okay. So let's say I multiply this by X, I will get X, Y plus 2xz equals to lambda xyz. If I multiply this by y, I get xy plus 2yz equals to lambda xyz. This guy here multiply by z, I get 2xz plus 2yz equals to lambda xyz. Now, all of the sudden, they are equal to each other. Right? Okay. Uh, so, from here, let's say equation 1, I set that equals to equation 2. I get xy plus 2xc equals to lambda xyc, which is equal to xy plus 2yc. That makes us having xc equals to yc. You see that? Now, of course, the c cannot be zero. Agree? Okay. The c, from here we see that x y c all of them has to be strictly positive right cannot be negative come on that's a volume so the dimension cannot be negative cannot can can even not be zero okay in other words because we know z cannot be zero we can safely divide by z and we get x equals to y required right okay now, uh, what else can we do? So, if x equals to y, hmm, if x equals to y, then I plug that into equation 3, then I get 2xc plus 2xz equals to uh, lambda x squared c. So, 4xc equals to lambda xc lambda x squared c right dividing by xz remember you need to first say it explicitly ahead of time that x and z cannot be zero from this uh, 
restriction here. Okay, so 4 equals to lambda x. Okay, so in other words, x equals to 4 over lambda, of course, because x equals to y, y also 4 over lambda. Right? I wonder if it helps in any way, though. Know? You know? Okay? Uh, so, x equals lambda, 4 over lambda y. How about the c, then? Hmm. You know what? Let's plug in the uh, equation 1 again. Equation 1, x, y plus 2, x. You know what? I don't need to use that one. I just need to use the original equation 1. So, y plus 2c equals to lambda yc but my y is 4 over lambda plus 2c equals to lambda times 4 over lambda times c hmm so 4 over lambda equals to lambda i uh, no equals to 4c In other words, z equals to 1 over lambda. Right? Okay, so maybe uh, I put it back there. So going into equation 4, I can put things together. x, y, c equals to 4 over lambda times 4 over lambda times 1 over lambda. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, no, 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 no. I make a mistake. I make a mistake. Uh, this is 4 over lambda plus 2 lambda. Right? Okay, so I have 4 over lambda equals to 2z. So z equals to 2 over lambda. Ah, good thing I didn't. Know. So this is 2 over lambda. Now this is equals to 32,000. Okay, so 32 over lambda cube equals to 32,000. So lambda cube equals to 1 over 1,000. So lambda equals to 1 over 10. <clears throat> actually, I don't need to. Huh? All I need is actually 1 over lambda cube. Uh, uh, well, up to you, up to you. So 1 over lambda cube equals to 1, one over, is equals to 1,000. So 1 over lambda equals to 10. Why? Because then x equals to 4 over lambda, that's 4 times 1 over lambda, right? But x equals to y, right? And the c is 2 over lambda. So the dimension will be dimension of the box that minimize, that has the volume 32,000 but minimize the amount of cardboard will be. Uh, 40 by 40 by 20 centimeter cube. Okay, in fact, we can compute what's the, the area, right? The area will be uh, 40, 40, 20. Uh, what is the full function? for area again, x, y, x, y plus 2 times x, z plus 2 times y, z, right? That is 1600 times 3, 4800 centimeter square. That's the minimum area required to construct such a box.
okay uh, did I give you suggested homework yet from here not yet huh okay let me put it now to be honest with you these two sections is very heavy like each question will take you so long time you know that's why I purposely uh, do the cut off for your test two it's at 14.6 and you have a lot more time to study for this 14.7 14.8 okay but of course the time will be useless if you don't study at all please practice okay and uh once you're done once if you have any questions feel free to ask me okay yeah, that's for that 14.8 let me go on to 15.1 now, 15.1 uh, is actually a very short section. It can be very long, but I'm not going to the, the too much computation, uh, numerical computation. Uh, so chapter 15. Chapter 15 is on multiple integrals. Yeah, we get a lot more complicated now. Okay, the good news is this section 15.1 is not complicated at all. Double integral over rectangle. double integral of a rectangle so the idea is in this section we want to see or observe or try to understand what is the double integral over a rectangle uh, which basically means you are doing integral over a rectangular domain so suppose I have uh, the function that looks like this let's say that's the surface okay but we want to observe or we want to compute the, the integral over the following domain and the domain is just a rectangle. The domain is a rectangle. I try my best to draw the rectangle. So this is the rectangular domain R, okay? And this S here is the surface over that domain R. How do we compute the integral? So let's write the notation first. So we want to compute double integral over domain R of the function fxy da the question is what does this mean okay now before i answer that question let's review a bit what we learned in calc one in calc one about the single integral in calc one when we have a function y equals to fx right over integral a to b integral from a to b or sometimes uh, uh, fx dx sometimes we just write it as integral over interval i of fx dx that was defined as the following we basically what we do is we partition the interval a b into a lot of small sections and for each section, let's say this section here, we choose a value there. And actually, we can choose any values there. As long as it is in this interval here, okay, you choose an xi, the value of xi, uh, an xi, and then you use the value of xi to represent the area of that rectangle. 
okay which is the approximate for the area of the under the curve in that section okay so the area of that section may be something looks like this right this is the delta x the length of the base okay you choose one of the xi okay and the xi turns out to be here now we represent the area of this blue strip here using the area of this red rectangle okay so the area of this that area is being approximated by the area of the rectangle okay which is equal to xi, uh, I'm sorry, fxi, that's the height of the function, the height of that rectangle, multiplied by delta x. Okay, now then, the total area under the curve is the limit the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals to 1 to n of such area of rectangle. Okay, now notice that uh, what happened is as you increase the number of partition, the, when you increase the number of partition, then this interval gets smaller and smaller, and eventually it gets less choices of uh, which xi you want to choose. In other words, uh, when you make the delta x become smaller, when we make the delta x become smaller, the sum of those rectangles i equals to 1 to n, the sum of that uh, area of that rectangle actually gets closer and closer to uh, the integrals. Okay? In other words, in other words, if you remember what we learned in uh, calculus 2 in regards of series, right? The series of this f x i delta x converges to the integral over interval i of f x dx as n goes to infinity. So the more you partition it, the smaller the interval, the smaller the delta x, okay? and the more accurate you can compute the value of uh, the integral okay now that gives the foundational uh, idea later on uh, to compute uh, numerically so so suppose 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 uh, I basically go back to something your calculus one instructor is supposed to teach you uh, suppose uh, if we want to compute how do we compute how do our car does our car compute the distance travel now of course one way is to see how many times the how many times the the uh, the wheel or the tires actually spins, right? Okay, that's one way. Okay, but another way is you compute how fast you compute the angular velocity. That's the angular velocity. Okay, from angular velocity, you can compute the linear velocity because that's basically the angular velocity multiplied by the radius of the wheel, 
of the tire, right? That will give you the linear velocity. Okay, now the distance is actually, the distance travel is actually the sum of those V, the velocity, multiplied by change of time. Okay, if you do your change of time to be like every one second, every two seconds, you add the velocity, right? Okay. Uh, you end up getting a distance which is basically uh, how to say that let's say this is the let's say this is the velocity function okay velocity function okay every one second you compute what is the velocity what is the velocity what's the velocity 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 when you add the total of those velocities it gives you the distance the area under the curve equals to the distance travel. Now, the thing is like when you drive, when you drive, your velocity, even though it seems to be continuous, but nobody knows, nobody knows what's the function of your velocity. You know, a different driver, different, different ways of driving, right? So the way your car computer is doing it is actually every seconds or every five seconds, I think the more, uh, the one uh, I think more reasonable is like every five seconds, maybe, I don't know, uh, it basically observe what's your velocity. Okay, and then it does this computation to find the distance. Okay, anyway, I'm not, I don't need to talk too much about that. Uh, uh, I think another way to, uh, yeah, I, I think I will leave it there. Now let's go to the, the, the two dimensional domain. If in calc one, that our, our domain is one dimensional, uh, in calc three, now our domain is two dimensional. We start with a rectangular domain. We start from rectangular domain. If we just look at the domain now, The way we do it is by partitioning this rectangle into a lot of small rectangles. We partition the X and we partition the Y's. You know what? Too many. Let me just make some instead of too many. So let's say I partition it this way. Okay, so we have uh, a lot of rectangles. Now, from each rectangle, from each rectangle, I choose one represent uh, representative uh, x y from each of them, and it doesn't have to be specifically the top top left or bottom left uh, or. Uh, you may choose the, the one you like, uh, you set the rules from the beginning, but it, actually you don't have to, okay? Call this coordinate here, X, I, Y, I. Call this coordinate here, coordinate X, I, Y, I. And then you observe what's the value. Okay, so in three dimension, it's basically as follows. In three dimension, what we basically doing is, after you partition that rectangle with x i y i, you compute what is the volume of that box, where the area of the base is d a. Maybe I should call that delta a delta a that's the area of the small rectangles okay x i y i is a coordinate in that small rectangle
okay and f of x i y i is the volume volume of the small box with base small rectangle okay uh, no actually not the volume it's the height not the volume sorry it's the height the height okay so the volume of that small box we denote that with delta v is actually equals to the value of the function at that coordinate of choice multiplied by delta a okay now when we add all of them when we add all such boxes small boxes Basically, we get the sum of f, x, i, y, i. Actually, I think I should say x, i, y, j. x, i, y, j. x, i, y, j. Not i's. Okay. The i's is the index for x, though j is index for y's. Okay, so you have a bunch of small rectangles there. And for each small rectangle, you choose the representative coordinates from that representative coordinates you choose the height that you want to use okay now you add all those the volume of those small boxes okay for i all i and j's okay now the thing is the i and j's are independent from each other let's make it like this i from 1 to n j from 1 to m of f x i y j the sum of x i mean delta x delta y okay maybe i keep that uh delta a for now Okay, now if I apply the limit where the m and the n goes to infinity of those little volumes, the volumes gets very, very small, right? Because you make the delta a a lot smaller, but at the same time, you have a lot more boxes to add. This is what we call double integral over region R of f, x, y, dA. Okay. Now, if, if the value of the function is non-negative, then that integral represent the volume represent the volume under the surface z equals to f x y over domain r okay basically if we look back right it's basically uh, one uh, give us the volume you see the surface here happens to be above uh, the y uh, above the the xy plane right okay so that integral will tell us the volume of this solid here the volume of this solid 
Okay. Now, if we want to find the average value of the functions over that domain R, then we basically divide the total, the integral, the double integral, or the multiple integral in this case, divide that by the area of the base. Okay, so the average value of f x y over r is given by 1 over the area of r times the integral, times the volume. Okay, the parallel of that in calculus one is the parallel of that in calculus one is the average value of fx over interval i is let's call that interval a, i b a to b, right? That is equal to 1 over b minus a, the length of that interval, integral from a to b of fx dx. Right? That's what we learned in calculus 1. The average value of a function over certain domain right? is the sum of all possible values divided by the, the length of the base or in calc 3, the area of the base. Okay? I think that's all I want to say for now, uh, beside, of course, some uh, foundational uh, fact that I would like to mention. Let me just, let me just uh, quote that. Uh, for example, for example, uh, some, some properties, okay, some properties. Okay. Double integral over R of f plus g of dA is equals to double integral over r of f dA plus double integral over g dA. Uh, we can also say it's plus minus, right? Okay, basically integral of sum equals to sum of integrals. Okay, notice it does not apply for multiplication. Okay, it doesn't apply for multiplication. It didn't apply even for multiplication in uh, in uh, single integral, right? This is not equals to integral of g times integral of f. You see what I mean? That's not true. Okay, that's not true. Integral of product is not equals to product of integrals. Okay, at least not in general. At least not in general. Okay. But the sum difference, yes. Okay. Integral of sum equals to sum of integrals. Second, integral of scalar multiple of a function over the domain R, dA, is equals to scalar multiple of the integral. Okay. And the third rules, uh, basically, these properties carries over from what we learned in calculus one. So, if f is greater or equals to g on that rectangle r, then double integral f x y d a over domain r must be greater or equals to the double integral of, of g over r. Okay. So, so uh, one, one little example, one little example. Uh, we have not learned how to compute this yet. Okay, but, but for example, we have f, x, y, uh, equals to e to the negative x negative y on uh, 0 to 3 by 
0 to 4 like over the domain 0 to 3 0 to 4 so over the domain this rectangle here okay so this is the x this is the y okay but on this interval in this domain here call this r okay e to the ne uh, negative x y minus y must be less than equals to e to the zero right which is one right because of that then consequently the integral over domain r of e to the negative x negative y da for sure is less than equals to double integral over r of 1 da right okay but at the same time this guy here is equals to the volume of the box with height 1 So what can we tell about this? What can we tell about this integral? Well, that integral must be 1 times 3 times 4, right? Because the area of the base is 12. 3 times 4 multiplied by the height 1 is 12. In other words, uh, without knowing the exact value of that double integral for now, okay, we know for sure that e to the negative x negative y dA for sure is less than equals to 12. Okay, and we also know that this guy is uh, greater than zero, right? Okay, in other words, we can bound this below by double integral over r of zero dA. Well, but uh, what is the volume if the height is zero? Well, the volume is just zero. Okay, in other words, we are sure that this double integral will give us something positive, but the result will be less than 12. Okay, uh, the suggested homework from here, my time's almost up. Uh, nothing much, but I would like you to at least try to compute uh, by looking at what the, uh, what the solid look like in uh, number 11 to number 14. 11, 14, uh, 17, 18. 11 to 14. 17, 18. That's the suggested homework for 15.1. Okay. 11 to 14, 17, 18. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's for today then.